We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. The words you just heard are the stated objectives of the Constitution of the United States. This statement of purpose is called the preamble, and it makes it quite clear that the Constitution is designed to enhance the value and dignity of the individual, not to make the individual a servant to the state. It's hard to imagine what life would be like in America without the Constitution. We would have no orderly system of government that regulates itself. We very likely could have a king with unlimited authority instead of a president who is held accountable by Congress and the people. We may even have anarchy where lawlessness runs rampant. But thankfully, we do have a Constitution and one that was so well thought out by the framers that it has stood the test of more than 200 years. The Founding Fathers, men like George Washington and James Madison from the Virginia delegation, and Benjamin Franklin from Pennsylvania, had brilliant minds, a vision for the future, and the wisdom to write our Constitution in such a way that it applied not only to life and commerce of their day, but remains viable and fresh in an age today when life is more different than they had ever dreamed possible. The document itself, now a treasured antique, is safeguarded here in the National Archives in Washington, D.C. It was written in 1787, but as Chief Justice John Marshall said early in the 19th century, the Constitution was intended to endure for ages to come and consequently to be adapted to the various crises of human affairs. The Constitution of the United States is the supreme law of the land. It is the foundation of our society, of our government. It's the ultimate rule book of the power struggles of our government. Um, it grants and limits power to the national government, to the states. Um, Charles Evans Hughes said that it was, um, that the Constitution is what the Supreme Court says it is. So. It can be labeled a number of different things, but it's the ultimate um, supreme law in our country. The Constitution is the supreme law of the land. It delineates or structures the powers between the three branches of our federal government and also the relationship between the federal government and the states, and then finally the relationship between the government and the American people. It grants and limits power. Uh, and, and in fact, you can read the entire document in terms of power, that it gives power and denies power to both the state and national governments, to citizens of the, the society. Uh, and, and in many ways, it's a document about power. In this program, we'll examine the seven articles that make up our Constitution. Article 1, the makeup of the legislative branch, which includes the House of Representatives and the Senate. Article 2, the executive branch, which has to do with the presidency of the United States. Article 3, the judicial branch, which is the Supreme Court, the highest court in the land. Article 4, the individual states of the Union and their relationship to each other. Article 5, the making of amendments and how the Constitution can be modified. Article 6, which establishes the Constitution as the supreme law of the land and Article 7, ratification and acceptance by the states. To best understand our Constitution, it's necessary to understand why we need it and the events that led up to it. The very first Constitution of the United States, written after we declared our independence from England in 1776, was called the Articles of Confederation. The leaders of the original 13 colonies quickly recognized its weaknesses it left each of the states vulnerable because each had too much individual sovereignty. The concept, united we stand, divided we fall, was threatening the strength of the states. The lack of a strong central government was causing serious problems in areas such as international relations, common defense, and economic growth. To address their problems, delegates from various states called a constitutional convention. The first constitutional convention was here in Annapolis. 
The Annapolis Convention was held in September of 1786, but not enough delegates were able to attend. The convention was rescheduled to meet in Philadelphia the following May. The summer of 1787 was destined to be one of the most important five months in American history. From May to September that summer, 55 of the country's most brilliant minds hammered out the provisions of our Constitution of the United States of America. Article 1, the legislative branch of government. This article is made up of 10 sections which set up and define the function of the legislative branch which is known as Congress. Before going into these 10 sections, it's important to understand that our government is made up of three distinct branches. The legislative branch, which makes the laws, the executive branch, which carries out the laws, and the judicial branch, which tries cases in court and explains the meanings of the laws when disputes occur. The framers of the Constitution made sure there would be separation of powers in our government. Each branch has its own distinct powers. For example, Section 1 of Article 1 states, All legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and House of Representatives. Only the legislative branch, the Congress, has the power to make United States laws. And even the Congress has a separation of powers being divided into two legislative bodies. The House of Representatives introduces new laws and votes on them. If passed by the House, the law then goes to the Senate, where the new law is again voted on. The framers um, did not create a true democracy. Uh, their intent was never to have um, everyone participate, uh, but to p participate through representation. And the Constitution creates a, a bicameral legislature in which there's an upper and lower house in which citizens go to the voting polls and elect people to represent them and to cast votes that represent their choices. The United States has a representative democracy and what that means is that there is no direct representation from the American people to make and enact laws. It comes through, laws are enacted by representatives of the American people that we elect to carry forth our duties and functions. The number of representatives each state may send to Washington came about through the Great Compromise. The Great Compromise was a dispute during the Constitutional Convention between the large states such as Pennsylvania and New York and the smaller states like Rhode Island. The large states wanted representation based upon population and the small states wanted equal representation no matter how big the the population or the size of the state. Uh, the compromise itself involved uh, the large states and small states both giving in creating the bicameral legislature that uh, the large states favored uh, uh, population so the lower house is created where population is uh, the key to representation. Right now it's about each representative represents about 600,000 voters. Uh, on the flip side, in, in the upper house, the Senate, it is done entirely uh, that each state has two, regardless of population, that it, it's an equal number. So the total representation in Congress is 535. Uh, by legislation, uh, the House is set at 435, and the Senate uh, is 100. The great compromise was that there would be two chambers in the U.S. Congress, one based upon population, and the other with equal representation no matter the size of the state. Section 2 of Article 1 sets the standards for electing representatives. They are to be elected every two years, at least 25 years of age, a citizen of the United States for at least seven years, and a resident of the state in which they are elected. Section 2 of Article 1 also provides for special elections to fill vacancies due to resignations or death and calls for election of a leader of the House called the Speaker and other officers. The Speaker of the House has a very important position. He is chairman of all meetings of the House of Representatives. He is the leader of the political party which has the largest number of members in the House. 
And if the president and vice president both die, or for some other reason leave office, the Speaker of the House assumes the job of President of the United States. Article 1, Section 2 also gives the House of Representatives another very important duty, that of impeachment. Founding father James Madison had this to say on the subject. If men were angels, no government would be necessary. In framing a government which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. When it becomes necessary to impeach an official of government, that is, charge him or her with high crimes or misdemeanors, the House of Representatives serves as the prosecutor, bringing specific charges against the individual and the Senate serves as the judge and jury. The 100 senators being the jurors and the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, the highest judge in the land, presiding over the proceedings and making legal decisions. When the senators vote on impeachment, it takes a two-thirds majority to convict. The result of impeachment is removal from office and a ban against the individual from ever holding any other position in the federal government in the future. Article 1, Section 3 establishes the makeup of the Senate, the requirements to be a senator, and who its officers shall be. Two senators are elected by citizens of each state to represent them in the Senate. Senators are elected to serve a six-year term in office, but elections are held in various states every two years giving the Senate a makeup of experienced lawmakers plus newcomers, which serves as a balance. To be elected to the office of Senator, a person must be at least 30 years of age, a citizen of the United States for at least nine years, and a resident of the state he is elected to represent. The position of President of the Senate is filled by the Vice President of the United States. His job is the same for the Senate as Speaker of the House is for the House of Representatives. The Senate members choose a president pro tem of the Senate, pro tem meaning temporary. He serves as leader of the Senate in the event the president of the Senate cannot fulfill his duties. Article 1, Section 4 and 5 establish the rules for congressional elections when Congress must meet the right to disqualify the election of anyone who does not meet constitutional standards, and it charges Congress to keep written records of all their meetings and make them available to the public. Section 6 states that members of Congress shall be paid for their services and paid out of the Treasury. It also gives congressmen immunity from arrest while conducting their business. The Constitution has a clause in it that specifies congressmen are immune from arrest either traveling to or coming from a session of Congress or while attending a session of Congress. This is because in earlier history there was a danger that the king in England would arrest or otherwise imprison members of the House of Commons if they did things that he did not like. So this protection was specifically to enable congressmen to be free to speak their political minds. The exemption for members of Congress for arrest uh, or prosecution from anything they say is more limited than you might think. It only involves their speech given on the floor of the House, uh, given in their legislative lawmaking context. Uh, it also includes, by the way, representatives for the members of Congress. So a staff member that is speaking solely uh, about the lawmaking ability of a member of Congress. It doesn't include media comments. It doesn't include things uh, said outside the context of lawmaking. Article 6 also protects society against potentially greedy congressmen by making it illegal for them to create high-paying jobs for themselves. No member of Congress shall be appointed to any civil office that Congress itself created. Likewise, if a person employed by the government is elected to Congress, he or she must quit that government job. Section 7 of Article 1 explains the veto power of the President of the United States. Before a bill becomes law, the President must sign it 
The Constitution gives the President 10 days to sign or reject a bill. If he hasn't signed it within 10 days, it automatically becomes law. Section 7 gives the President the right to veto or reject a bill, which returns it to the House that originated it along with his objections. Congress then has the right to reconsider the bill. If both Houses of Congress, the House of Representatives and the Senate, pass the bill with a two-thirds majority in both Houses, the bill will become law in spite of the President's objections. The framers were concerned of uh, a monarchy of power being housed in one area, so that they intentionally designed a system where large numbers of people have to agree or form some consensus for things to be accomplished. Uh, for example, to pass a piece of legislation, uh, both houses of Congress must agree to it in the exact same word and form. It must be sent to the President of the United States, who can either sign it or veto it. It then can be overridden with a veto. There is even a provision for a pocket veto, so that it takes at least two houses uh, of Congress, and it takes the President as well, so it takes two branches of government to accomplish that feat of making something a law. Section 7 of Article 1 gives the House of Representatives the sole responsibility to write legislation which is meant to raise revenues. Both houses, of course, must agree to pay such legislation. The reason tax legislation must start in the House of Representatives is another example of our Founding Fathers' wisdom. Our government must have money to conduct the business of our country, and it's the citizens who must pay the bills by way of taxes. But if we don't like the way our representatives are spending our money, new elections come around every two years, and we can vote our representatives out of office. Senators are more difficult to remove since they're elected to six-year terms. Much of Section 8 of Article 1 has to do with the finances of our country. The first clause of Section 8 gives Congress the power to collect taxes to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. It also gives Congress the power to borrow money on the credit of the United States, to regulate commerce with foreign nations, and regulate commerce among the several states. These regulations include taxes which create another source of revenue for the government. Article 1, Section 8 lists off 18 enumerated powers of Congress. Uh, they include things like raising and supporting armies, but one of the powers is to regulate commerce, uh, both between the states and between the countries and the Indian tribes. Uh, the Commerce Clause is deceptively simple and enormously important. Uh, it allows the national government great hay in regulating more than just goods moving from place A to place B. The government's right to regulate the economy extends to goods, persons, and words. We have expanded the traditional notion of interstate commerce to reflect a growing and more sophisticated economy and our, cons and our current ideas of what constitutes interstate commerce includes virtually all interactions in our present economy, including goods, including ideas, and finally including persons and the work that persons do in our economy. Uh, it's been used to regulate a number of social ills, such as civil rights, almost all the civil rights legislation, uh, and changes have come about through Commerce Clause uh, cases, uh, so that the Commerce Clause is much larger than you might imagine. It's include the regulation of words through uh, the Interstate Commerce Commission. It includes the regulation of mail, uh, the regulation of transportation, uh, all sorts of things, so that it's a, it's a much larger right than uh, probably you would think uh, upon reading it. Another important part of controlling the finances of our country is the power Congress has to mint coins and print money and place a proper value on our currency. By the same token, Congress has the power to punish people who counterfeit currency of the United States. Section 8 of Article 1 concludes with a variety of miscellaneous powers granted to the federal government by the Constitution. To establish a uniform rule of naturalization for foreign immigrants. And uniform laws on the subject of bankruptcies. 
to fix the standards of weights and measures, to establish post offices and post roads, to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries, to constitute tribunals inferior to the Supreme Court which means establish federal courts which are lower in authority than the Supreme Court. An extremely important part of Article I, Section 8 is the power given to Congress to defend our country against aggression. Congress has the right to define and punish piracies and felonies committed on the high seas and offenses against the law of nations. To declare war and capture enemy land and water, the President may decide to use force against aggression, as when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor in 1941, but the Congress must approve it. They have the official authority to declare war. It is Congress's right to raise and support armies and provide and maintain a navy. This means they can draft citizens into military service and allocate money to support them, but only money enough for two years. There was a concern when the Constitution was written that there would be too much power vested in the militia or the army. So therefore, there wanted to be some degree of control over the, over the military. As a result of that, Congress was limited to two years of funding for the military. That was to control or have some authority over the army and the U.S. military more broadly. It was part of our separation of powers. Charles Evans Hughes once said that uh, the power to wage war is also the power to wage war successfully. That uh, the creation of Congress's power to raise and support armies also allows them to only incur them for a, a small amount of time in the sense that uh, the framers were concerned that the the, that the armies would be freestanding, that they would not be under civilian control. Uh, one of the things that makes our system of government very unique is that the head of our military is a civilian. Uh, it is not a member of the armed forces. Article 1, Section 8 also sets the guidelines for the establishment of a district not exceeding 10 miles square, which is to be the seat of the federal government. This district has become known as the District of Columbia, which is not a state, nor part of any state. Its only city is Washington, and it's the home of our federal government, including the President, Congress, the Supreme Court, and various supporting agencies. In addition to the land set aside for our federal government in Washington, D.C., the Constitution allows Congress to exercise authority over various lands throughout the nation to establish forts, dockyards, post offices, other federal buildings, and national parks. The government is the largest landowner in the nation. An important clause that is found at the end of Article 1, Section 8 is sometimes called the Elastic Clause, since it lets Congress stretch its powers to fit the changing needs of an unseen future. It states Congress has the power to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers. These enumerated powers were clarified in 1819 by the Supreme Court. Chief Justice John Marshall wrote, The government of the Union, though limited to its powers, is supreme within its sphere of action. In other words, where Congress has the power to act, its actions take precedence over state actions. Article 1, Section 9 contains some very important fundamental American liberties, such as the writ of habeas corpus. I think the writ of habeas corpus is extremely important. Uh, in, in American history, or actually Old English history, t tells you a lot about it. What the word habeas corpus means, bring, means bring me the body. It's intended to be an important protection against false imprisonment. A habeas corpus writ is something that you can take to the federal judiciary and say that you are being held unconstitutionally. So the writ of habeas corpus requires that the government, be it the state, the national government, the city, whatever level of government, uh, can only hold you for a certain period of time, and it's usually about 24 to 72 hours before you're brought before a judge, 
told the charges that are facing you and are officially arraigned by the court. And within that time period, uh, the government must act or they must let you go, uh, which is a tremendously important right. Habeas corpus is considered one of the most fundamental and important guarantees in our Constitution. The balance of Article 1, Sections 9 and 10, deal with clarifications on tax collection rights and restrictions on states to not infringe on the federal government's constitutional privileges. One interesting clause near the conclusion of Article 1 prohibits any title of nobility being granted by the United States or any person holding public office accepting a title from any king, prince, or a foreign state. A clear reaction to the power of dictators and monarchies seen so clearly when the colonies were under British rule. Article 2, Section 1, the executive or presidential branch of government. Section 1 states that the executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States of America. No single sentence in the Constitution has been debated so hotly as this one. The question remains, what is the executive power? Executive power is very different when you contrast it with the legislative power. Whereas Congress has these enumerated list of powers, these 18 things listed off in Article 1, Section 8, Article 2 doesn't do that for the executive. Uh, the power is much more vague, uh, which has allowed presidents to interpret it broadly. George Washington tried to steer a middle course between a king-like presidency with too much power and a very limited and weakened presidency, which would be ineffectual to the tasks demanded of our federal government. Some have interpreted it to mean only those things strictly enumerated in the Constitution. Other presidents have said it's, it's anything that, that uh, is not unconstitutional. In other words, if there's no limit on it, it's a, it's a power that I hold. Continuing through the line of presidents, we see these same issues of too much power or too little power with John Adams and then Thomas Jefferson. In the modern era, numerous presidents have taken, so to speak, a liberal line with regard to their powers as in given in the Constitution. For example, President Truman seizing uh, private industry for concern of the war effort. President Reagan, for example, directly defied an act of Congress during the Iran-Contra scandal by selling arms to the Iranian government. We have traditionally given wide berth to the president when it comes to foreign affairs. At the same time, it seems like the presidents often want more latitude or more control when it comes to these important issues. Article 2, Section 1 spells out the qualifications to be president. He must be a natural-born citizen of the United States, at least 35 years of age, and a resident of the United States for at least 14 years. He shall hold office for a term of four years and be elected by the Electoral College. This original constitutional mandate has since been modified. The framers of our Constitution were very concerned about the direct election of the president by the American people. So the framers implemented something known as the Electoral College. The Electoral College uh, is one of the things that uh, is the most misunderstood by Americans. Uh, I've actually uh, seen quotes in the news where Americans will say the Electoral College, that they would love to send their child there if they could afford the tuition. In each state in the United States, we elect representatives who then meet after the November election in the capital of that state to directly elect the president. There are, are two times in history where actually the popular vote get or did not actually get the most electoral votes. The way the Electoral College works is that each state gets a number of electors that are designated by the number of House members and senators they have combined. So for example, Vermont and Wyoming have three. They have the smallest number available. They have one House member and two senators. In California, a large state, you have something like 50. The Constitution stipulates that the president is to be fairly compensated for his duties, but that his salary cannot be increased or decreased during his term in office. The president receives a lot of administrative help from the cabinet departments, 
The Constitution did not establish the cabinets, however. There's no mention of them in the Constitution. But our first president, George Washington, appointed four men to be his closest advisors. This was the first cabinet. Thomas Jefferson was appointed Secretary of State. Alexander Hamilton was the first Secretary of the Treasury. Edmund Randolph was Attorney General. And Washington named Henry Knox as his Secretary of War, a post now called Secretary of Defense. Over the years, as the country grew, many more cabinet departments were added to the executive branch of government. The Constitution provides for a replacement of the president in case of death or other removal from office. For example, Franklin D. Roosevelt died while in office. He was succeeded by his vice president, Harry S. Truman. If Truman had died while president, the presidency, according to the Constitution, would have gone to the Secretary of State, who is appointed by the president. Presidential succession then went to other members of the president's cabinet, all people appointed by the president and not elected by the people. In 1947, Congress saw this as a potential problem and changed the presidential succession to first the vice president, then to the Speaker of the House of Representatives, then to the President Pro Tem of the Senate, individuals who are elected by the people and not appointed by the President. The Constitution names the President of the United States Commander-in-Chief of the Army, Navy, and the Militia of the several states, in other words, the National Guard. Article II gives a variety of other powers to the president. He may grant reprieves or pardons for offenses against the United States. He has the power to make treaties, appoint ambassadors to other countries, appoint judges to the Supreme Court, and fill vacancies in the Senate. Many of the president's appointments must be ratified by a two-thirds majority vote of the Senate, but many don't, which gives the president significant power. The president has enormous influence over the executive branch in his appointment power. The president has the ability to appoint literally hundreds of officials in the executive branch. These are known as political appointments. Many require, however, as a check upon presidential power, the advice and consent of the Senate. Presidents are charged with the uh, requirement of taking care to faithfully execute the laws. And in their process of doing that, uh, the logic of the framers was to allow them to put people in positions to assist them in executing the laws of the nation. The president, while requiring the approval or the consent of, se of the Senate to appoint someone ahead of a branch, can absolutely remove someone at his own discretion. The Constitution requires that the President deliver to Congress his State of the Union message and recommend measures that he feels are necessary and expedient. The Constitution also charges that he shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed. In reality, this is a huge job that no President could do single-handedly. The President delegates the job of federal law enforcement to such agencies as the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Treasury Department. Finally, Article II spells out the crimes for which a President, Vice President, and civil officers of the United States may be removed from office by way of impeachment if they are charged and found guilty of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. There have been only two presidents in the history of our country who have been impeached, Andrew Johnson and Bill Clinton. Both were found not guilty in the Senate, Johnson by only one vote. In 1974, the House Judiciary Committee voted three charges of impeachment against President Richard M. Nixon, but he resigned from office before the charges could be voted upon by the House. Andrew Johnson's trouble with uh, Congress uh, had much to do with politics as well as uh, the Tenure of Office Act, uh, which required uh, certain requirements of removal of the president and 
Johnson removes his Secretary of War anyway. Uh, there is some feeling that the impeachment of Johnson by the House and almost conviction, one vote shy in the Senate, uh, was partisan and not simply based on uh, the ability of the president to remove. Impeachment is an inherently political process. By vesting impeachment powers in the House of Representatives and the trial in the Senate, the framers inherently injected politics into the impeachment process. The definition of what is an impeachable offense um, varies widely. There have been some that argue it's uh, anything that the Senate wants to uh, impeach for, anything that the House can uh, draw up as articles of impeachment and the Senate they can convict on. Uh, others argue it's for only uh, criminal offenses of the criminal code, uh, and still others argue that it's even broader than that, it involves crimes against the state, things such as treason, uh, that, that they are major crimes against uh, the United States government. The issue of the charges against Clinton compared to the um, code of conduct for midshipmen here uh, created a great deal of angst for the midshipmen. And, um, again, their job is to uh, uphold the Constitution of the United States. Uh, they are to abide by the orders of their commander-in-chief. Uh, but the hard part for them, I think, was that uh, for the very same offense, they would be um, taken out of the academy, possibly uh, dishonorably discharged, even court-martialed in the military for the very same offense. So certainly it created um, an air of double standard here. Article 2 of the Constitution, which has to do with the presidency, contains only 320 words, but it clearly makes him one of the most powerful people in the world, not immune, however, from removal by impeachment, and consequently, our country can never be governed by a tyrant, king, or dictator. Article 3, the judicial branch of government. This article gives ultimate power to decide legal questions to the Supreme Court. It states, the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court, and in such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. The judicial branch has the power to decide whether a federal, state, or local law is constitutional, that is, permitted or forbidden by the Constitution. The Supreme Court has specific power, called original jurisdiction, that no other court has in all cases affecting ambassadors, other public ministers, and consuls, and those in which a state shall be a party. But the primary job of the Supreme Court is its role as an appeals court. It is, in fact, the highest appeals court in the land, settling disputes presented by lower courts. The Supreme Court can't hear all cases, however, since so many lower court cases are submitted to them. Various federal appeals courts handle much of this responsibility, while the Supreme Court deals only with those of the greatest constitutional importance. The function of the Supreme Court is to interpret the Constitution. That is its primary duty and the reason for being. The Supreme Court has had an influ enormously influential role in it telling us what the Constitution means. Um, the power of interpretation of the, Supreme, of the Constitution by the Supreme Court is, is huge. Uh, the role of the Supreme Court is to uh, ensure that the Constitution of the United States always is the supreme law of the land. Uh, that's a heavy burden for the court. And their one and only big stick is the power of judicial review. The single most important case in Supreme Court history is one of its first cases, Marbury versus Madison. Marbury versus Madison established firmly the concept of judicial review that the Supreme Court had the power to determine the constitutionality of acts of Congress. The power to review, to look again at the acts of any other governmental actor, be it Congress, be it the executive, and look at it again and evaluate its constitutionality. Article 3 of the Constitution establishes that a person accused of a crime must be tried by a jury and that that person must be tried in the state in which the crime is said to have occurred. Finally, Article 3 defines what is meant by treason. 
In England, kings executed people for treason when the crime was really nothing more than displeasing the king. In America, the framers wanted to be sure no one was punished for vague or false charges of treason. Article 4, the states, their relationship one to another, and their relationship to the federal government. Section 1 of Article 4 says that full faith and credit shall be given in each state to the public acts, records, and judicial proceedings of every other state. This means that public acts, that is the laws, birth and death records, and court decisions of one state are to be honored by other states. If a court in one state makes a decision, that decision will be held up in any other state, and the Congress will stand behind this concept. Section 2 of Article 4 orders all states to treat citizens from any other state as their own, entitled to all privileges and immunities. Just as states cooperate in extending hospitality to citizens of their neighboring states, states cooperate in apprehending and turning over criminals from neighboring states who attempt to escape from justice by fleeing across state lines. Section 3 of Article 4 gives Congress the right to add new states to the Union, just as Hawaii was added as our 50th state on August 21st, 1959. But as regards the formation of a state within a state, or the subdividing or joining with other states to form new states, such boundary changes can be done, but only with the consent of the legislatures of the states concerned, as well as the consent of Congress. Article 4 also gives to Congress the right to govern national lands which are located within the boundaries of the various states. This clause makes it possible for the federal government to set aside and care for national parks and forests, build hydroelectric projects, and manage public property for the use of the citizens of the United States. Finally, Article 4 makes a promise to the states of the Union to guarantee a Republican form of government, protection against invasion and protection when needed, against riots or other disturbances within the state. Article 5 of the Constitution explains how changes in the Constitution are proposed and adopted. First, amendments can be proposed by a two-thirds vote in both the House and Senate, or in a national convention called by Congress when asked to do so by the legislature of two-thirds of the states. Amendments are ratified in one of two ways by the legislatures of the states or by special conventions called in the states. Either way, if three-fourths of the states approve the amendment, it becomes a part of the Constitution and law for all states. The formal process of amending the Constitution is really quite difficult. Uh, it's amazing it's only been amended uh, so few times compared to constitutions around the world or, or even looking at state constitutions. Some state constitutions have been amended two, three hundred times. Uh, the mechanism is quite difficult. The, the way that, that it's proposed, it's a two-step process of a proposal and there's two methods of proposal and two methods of ratification. Uh, require a large number of people to agree uh, and uh, many more amendments are proposed than, than adopted. It's important to remember the Constitution is not a civic religion. It's not a sacred document. It's a practical document. It really is intended to be a working document. And as such, it's a work in progress. The typical amendment of the Constitution is not the formal way, but the informal, either by executive interpretation or legislative power or judicial interpretation. That's really more how, it, how it's changed and grown as a document than the official uh, amendments that, are, that actually exist. Article 6, the supremacy of the Constitution. This article, in essence, says the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. It's typical legal language that you might find in any legal contract. In this case, between a government and its people, affirming that the new government will pay its debts, that this is the supreme law of the land and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby, 
and that every official of the federal and state governments shall swear to uphold it. You, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear. I, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear. That you will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of your ability, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. Article 6 also sets up a uniformity of law for the entire nation. The Supremacy Clause is part Part of Article 6, which says that uh, it sets up the hierarchy of law. It says that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, treaties thereof, laws of Congress, state constitutions, state laws, etc., down, down the line. The reason that's significant is that whenever these two laws conflict, the winner is always the higher law, which means it's the Constitution or it's sometimes the national law which has great effect when the states and Congress both want to deal with something, both want to regulate it. Um, if the states do something which violate federal statute or federal law, it's negated by the Supremacy Clause. So it's, it's significant that it, it, it is a unique requirement of our federal system that for laws have to be uniform, for the predictability of citizens to understand what the law is, that you can't have the nation allow one thing and the state not the other, et cetera. So, so the Supremacy Clause is really important. Ratification of the Constitution. The authors and signatories of the Constitution set their names to the document in affirmation of their agreement. These were the greatest political minds of their day, and the document they had created is a marvel of democracy in action. Proof of its validity is the fact that within a year, 11 of the 13 original states had approved it, making it the supreme law of the land. In 1789, George Washington became our first president, and all 13 states had ratified the Constitution by 1790. Yet there were some, such as anti-federalist patriots like Thomas Jefferson, who feared the Constitution didn't go far enough to protect individual rights. Their concerns led to the Bill of Rights. I think sometimes we tend to make the document or we tend to make the Constitution too sacred instead of realizing that it was created by men and women who were fallible, just as we are. The real intent of the Constitution was as a preventative document, if you will. And it's important to keep that in mind because that's why we have a separation of powers, to prevent too much power from getting into the hands of a person who would misuse it, rather than having too much power from getting into the hands of a person who could use it for good. It's a pretty complex document. Uh, there's a wonderful story of a, a man who teaches, he no longer teaches constitutional law at Yale and taught it for years, uh, years and years. And about this time, he's about 80 years old. And someone asks him, what does the Constitution mean? And he actually looks at this person. This is a man who spent 50 years of his life easy interpreting it and understanding it and studying it and writing about it and thinking about it. And his answer was, you know, I'm just starting to really understand what the Constitution really means.